It's been almost seven years since I began releasing personal development content, videos, this whole actualize.org business. And in those seven years, I was on this journey to discover for myself how reality works, what personal development is, what are the best ways to do it, what are the most effective teachings, what does it all mean, what does it all boil down to? Because when I began this journey, even, of course, much uh, earlier than seven years ago, seven years ago, is when I was just started to teach you guys. But before that, when I was just trying to figure out life for myself, the big question was like, what are the principles that I need to learn to get the kind of life that I want? And it seemed like there were so many different directions that we could go in. Like we could pursue money, we could pursue uh, inner self-esteem work. We could pursue shadow work, or we could do therapy, or we could do NLP, or we can do psychedelics, or we can do meditation, or we could do yoga, or we could like, there's so many things to do. So <laughs> how do you make sense of all of that? And so just recently in the last couple of weeks, I really have uh, found for myself what it all boils down to, what the highest teaching is. This is the highest teaching in the whole universe. <laughs> I've boiled it down to one single phrase. It's so simple. It's shockingly simple, and it unifies everything. So what is this highest teaching? It's self-love. Self-love. But this is no ordinary self-love as you think of it. I'm going to have to explain what this really means, because when you compress all of human development, and not just human development, but all development of all conscious beings in the entire universe, when you compress that entire, <laughs> that entire mission, so to speak, into a, a two-word phrase, self-love, uh, of course, a lot is lost. A lot of the detail is lost. It's necessarily very high level and very abstract. And you don't know what to do with it. So I need to explain to you what to do with it, how to decipher it. We got to break this down. That's what we'll be doing in this episode. But self-love, I'm talking about capital uppercase S self and capital uppercase L love. So capital self, capital L love. Got it? So if all of actualized that our teachings could be distilled to one teaching, this would be it. If you understood this one teaching properly, you would be able to derive all the other teachings and understand how they fit in and what function they have. Or you would understand that some of them are, are extraneous and, and useless. Of course, over the last seven years, I've gone through a whole inner journey of understanding reality and every week basically for the last seven years my understanding of reality has been growing and changing and radically transforming which is why sometimes people accuse me of oh leo why do you contradict yourself so much well the reason is is because i'm constantly growing so i'm not afraid to admit making mistakes and saying things that are wrong and changing my mind later because i would rather be right in the end rather than insist that i was right from the beginning you see, so if you go back seven years and watch my early stuff, it's going to feel very different. It's going to sound very different. And certain things that I say are no longer applicable from the standpoint that I'm at now. But also what I understand is that I can only have gotten to where I am now. I can only have reached this sort of pinnacle of understanding how it all boils down to self-love by having gone through that process and making all of those mistakes. And you will too. And every living conscious being will of course they won't all make the same mistakes i've made <laughs> we, we all make our own individual mistakes some of us make a lot more of them than others okay um and some of us are much more stubborn about clinging to our mistakes rather than admitting we were wrong uh so of course but you're gonna have to go through this process this is not something you can just avoid 
And even though I'm going to tell you the ultimate answer, self-love, you can't just take that and now go run with it and live your whole life with it. Not really, because what your life is, is the actualization and the realization of what self-love means and why it's important and why it all boils down to this and not something else. And this is rather shocking because, you know, if I traveled back in time and told my old seven-year-old self, I mean, seven years ago, not seven years old, just uh, seven years ago, if I told myself that I would be teaching self-love and that's all that this will boil down to, my old self would have said, no way, this is some sort of hippy, dippy, airy, fairy, new agey nonsense. It's not practical. It's not realistic. How is this really going to address all the problems people have? Uh, what have you been smoking? I would have told myself that because I had to go through the, the process. It's, it's a huge process and you will too. But also it's helpful for you to understand that this is how it is. And I told you so. So in 10 years and 20 years, when you finally figure it all out, if you get that far even, uh, you'll realize I told you so. And this will be helpful because maybe it'll speed up your process. So here's an interesting thought experiment for you. Imagine that mankind makes contact with a highly advanced, highly intelligent alien species. Ask yourself, what do you think this species would teach mankind? Let's say we had limited time, limited bandwidth, what would be the most important thing that they could teach us? Now, many materialists and scientists like to go to some sort of gadgetry or technology or some sort of technical scientific knowledge. Like, well, they could teach us how to build a warp drive and travel faster than light. That would be a game changer. Or they would teach us what, how to create super smart AI that we could use to improve our life, or they would teach us how to cure cancer or something like this. But that's not what they would teach us. If they taught us that, they would be a rather unintelligent alien species. Because all of that stuff, it seems important. If you're looking at reality from sort of materialistic paradigm, and you're bought into this technological fantasy, this tech utopia, where we just have more technology and this solves all our problems, but what you don't realize is that it doesn't solve anything. Because the underlying problem is a lack of self-love, a lack of understanding of what self-love is. So what I'm proposing is that if we ever make contact with such an intelligent species, and I don't, I don't claim that we will or we won't, uh, uh, I'm agnostic about that. I've never met any aliens myself yet, but uh, um, I mean, it's reasonable that they're out there. Uh, but if we meet them, <laughs> the funny thing is, is that now I'm conscious enough to understand what they would teach us. Self-love. Because that's what we're lacking the most. And because that is the ultimate lesson of the universe, not just for humans. Right? What I'm talking about here is much more profound than just simply some feel-good emotion for humans. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an existential force that drives all of evolution. Every species in the entire universe and other universes if they exist. Beyond our own. Multiverses, whatever else. And what I'm telling you is that you can become conscious of this for yourself. You don't have to believe me. This is something you will discover. I'm just giving you a preview of what you will discover. And anyways, the more intelligent these aliens would be, the more they would stress the importance of self-love. Now, it seems kind of weird. In, in fact, us humans, you can, you can almost imagine that, imagine sort of a movie scenario. This would actually be a really interesting kind of a movie scenario where humans make contact with aliens for a brief time and these aliens deliver this most important of messages. But then the humans, you know, and the, the aliens say, here's our most important advice for you. The humans, they receive this advice. And then the scientists, they look at it like, what is this self-love? No, this can't, this can't possibly be their advice. 
What kind of advice is this? This is, this doesn't help us. They're supposed to tell us about warp engines and things. And then they throw it in the trash and they don't even communicate that message to the rest of society. You see, this is the problem when you run this through the materialist paradigm filters. It takes already a fairly high degree of development and consciousness to be able to even appreciate such a teaching and not to dismiss it as some sort of fluff. But of course, interestingly, you know, this is not only a thought experiment. There actually are people who claim to have made contact with entities and aliens through, for example, smoking and NDMT. And if you read their trip reports and you talk to them about their life transforming experiences, very consistently what they report is that uh, these entities that they meet, their greatest message is self-love. Is that just a, a fantasy? Is that just a hallucination? Well, don't believe them. Don't believe me. Go check it out for yourself. Verify for yourself. It's not hard to verify this stuff if you're really interested. I mean, after all, when people make such extravagant claims, don't just sit there on your ass and play the lazy skeptic where you're just skeptical about everything because it doesn't sound plausible to you. Go try it. You see, there's a big difference between making bold, outrageous assertions about life and reality which are unverifiable and no method of verification is given versus other bold and outrageous claims, which of course I make a lot of. <laughs> I make a lot of outrageous claims. You know, I tell you that you, you're immortal. Um, but what I also tell you is I, I, I tell you that you can verify it for yourself and I give you the methods that you can use. Of course, most of you guys don't use these methods because they're difficult to use. You can't just go and do something for five minutes and then you're done. Although, of course, actually, in this case, with NNDMT, you can. Literally, you can go smoke it in five minutes. You can find out whether this is real or not. Go find out if you if you dare. Or let's just keep talking more about self-love. You know, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. Uh, anyways, so... Uh, The only way that an alien can be more intelligent than you is if it understands self-love deeper than you. If you understand self-love deeper than an alien, you're more intelligent than that alien. You should be teaching it, not it teaching you. Okay. But see, us humans, we're, we're so poor at understanding and appreciating self-love and practicing self-love that... Uh, <laughs> uh, if we ever did meet some, some intelligent aliens, chances are very good that they would understand self-love much, much, much deeper than we do. Which is actually an interesting little uh, practical rule of thumb that you can use for the rest of your life. How do you judge the quality of a teacher or a teaching? You know, there's a lot of different teachings and teachers out there. Who do you trust? Which books should you read and which ones should you believe and which ones aren't? Which ones are the good gurus and which ones are the bad gurus? How do you know? Which ideologies are the good ones and which ones are the bad ones? It's very easy to determine simply by the degree of self-love in that teaching. Rate the degree of self-love in this teaching on a scale of 0 to 10. So, we can take fascism, we can take old school Soviet communism, we can take Nazism, we can take white nationalism, we can take uh, capitalism, we can take socialism, we can take various kinds of ideologies, various cults, we can take Christianity, we can take Buddhism, we can kind of put them, arrange them all on a spectrum. We can take science, put science in there, biology, chemistry, physics, all that, put it on a spectrum and uh, give each one a rating and see how they all line up. And what you're going to discover is the truest and highest ones have the most self-love and promote the most self-love. And of course, not necessarily in those words. And I'll, I'll explain what self-love means here in a lot of detail in a minute. I'm holding back a little bit. 
to tease you. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we can arrange it like that, and then in this way, you can you can find very quickly what the highest teachings are. And but you don't need to be some sort of like scientist who rates these systems. You know, you don't need to be so scientific uh, about your rating scale. You can just feel it. Literally, you can feel it in your body with your heart. If you want, you can just read a teaching, read a book, listen to a teacher, and just ask yourself, what's the degree of self-love of this teacher in teaching? Not just in words, but also in speech, in action, in the way that they hold themselves, the way they carry themselves, in all aspects of their life, in their relationships, in their business, in their money making, in, in their sex life, all that. And you will get a really good sense of how pure this teacher is. To the degree which, to which self-love is lacking or any judgment or hatred is present in the teachings, that betrays the corruption of the teacher or the teaching. So you can look at something like uh, Nazism. You can read Hitler's biography and, uh, and his autobiography. Read through his teachings and listen to it. And then just ask yourself, is this coming from a place of self-love? How much so? And of course, you'll see that it isn't, which is why it's a problematic ideology. And if you go and you look at some Wahhabist, a radical Islamic ideology, you'll also see the same thing. Is it coming from a place of self-love? And you'll, you'll clearly see that it's not. Now, of course, it's a little bit tricky because sometimes, like, for example, uh, with Christianity, with Catholicism, for example, uh, they like to preach about love. And love is written in, in their Bible, in certain parts at least, certain parts not so much, <laughs> probably more in the New Testament. They like to preach about, you know, Jesus' love and, and so forth. So, in this sense, you might say, oh, well, Christianity is the highest teaching. Well, in a certain sense, it is in that sense. But there's still a problem because words are cheap. It's really easy to talk a big game about self-love, but then are you actually practicing it? Most Christians, most Catholics, even uh, most priests and cardinals are pretty poor in the implementation of the self-love, which is why there's corruption and problems in the Catholic Church. That's the corruption. And to the degree in which a religious teaching has any judgment or hatred within it whatsoever, hatred of gays, hatred of Jews, hatred of Muslims, hatred of Christians, hatred of Buddhists, hatred of, of poor people, hatred of rich people, hatred of <clears throat> sick people, judgment of criminals, damning them to hell and so forth, or even hatred of witches, hatred of witchcraft and the occult, fear of these things. Of course, hatred and judgment go hand in hand with fear. Fear of any of these things, if it's present in one of these spiritual teachings, that's your clue that it's a corrupt teaching. Maybe it was pure at some point. Maybe it was a pure teaching when it came out of Jesus' mouth 2,000 years ago, but it ain't anymore. It got corrupted, and that's how you know it got corrupted. See? Really, really handy rule of thumb. So, uh, let's return to this question of self-love. I guess the question is, how do you apply it? Because it's so abstract and so compact. It's, it's hard to apply because of this. But believe it or not, and here's my bold, outrageous claim, which you can try to test for yourself to see if it's true that all of mankind's problems ultimately stem back to a lack of self-love. But what does this really mean? How could this be the case? It seems like it's so impractical to say this. It sounds airy-fairy, it sounds new agey, it sounds like, well, Leo, but, you know, the people in the Congo, starving children in the Congo, uh, you know, they don't need self-love. What they need is food. What they need is vaccines. What they need is a better economy. They need practical things. They need technology. They need 
clean running water. This is what they need, not your bullshit self-love. They can't live off self-love. But see, here now, we're going to start to define what self-love is. Self-love is a much more robust notion than you think. Remember, capital S, self, and capital L, love. So we're talking about the ultimate self, not yourself as a human identity. I'm not saying that you need to love yourself as Leo or whatever you are, as a man or as a woman or as black or as white. I'm saying you got to love yourself as the self that you really are, the awakened self, which is the entire universe. So if you do that, then all the other problems will autocorrect themselves. And I'll show you in a lot of practical detail in a minute how that works with specific examples, right? So I'm not just going to be bullshitting you here. But first, a little bit more of the sort of the abstract theory. So self-love has two components, self and love. So the two most important aspects of understanding and implementing rather self-love is to understand what self and love actually are. You need to actually be conscious of what these things are to understand them. And you can't, from your current state of consciousness, you can't do that from your current state of consciousness. You can't do that through thinking. You can't do it through reason and you can't do it through logic. And you can't do it through science, not the materialistic science that we all commonly know. So the most important element for implementing and actualizing self-love is to have a proper definition of what self and love are. And see, that is the first step. And already everyone, almost everyone on the planet has failed at step number one. So they can't go any further and they can't implement it. Which is why it's so important to spend a lot of time talking about what is the true self and what is love with a capital L. But of course, talking about it is not nearly going to be enough. Really, what's required is a direct mystical experience of the true self and love with a capital L. You need these two distinct mystical experiences. These are two facets of awakening. I've talked about that in my episode about many facets, the many facets of awakening. These are just two. There's more than two. But these are the two you need. These are the two crucial ones that you need of course, you can have them simultaneously together as one glorious insight where they're fused into one because they are the same thing, ultimately. But also, you can see them as two separate things. You can glimpse one, then the other, and vice versa, and then you can glimpse them together and, and see how they interact uh, and so forth. See, so, uh, look, <laughs> uh, with, my, with, with the stuff that I teach now, it's... It's so advanced that it it just it won't it won't change your life unless you have these mystical experiences, right? So the reason I'm stressing this so much is because I know that many of you are watching and you're like you're trying to get it, you're trying to figure it out, but you're just you're spinning your wheels in the mud. Because you're lacking these mystical experiences and nothing can substitute for these mystical experiences. You need a mystical experience of self and need a mystical experience of love, then come back and you will understand what I'm talking about. And there, there will still be plenty more to talk about and plenty more for you to understand. You're not going to be done. But you need at least a glimpse of that, right, to start to take these things I say seriously. Then they'll start to make sense for you. And then the real work begins. The real work then begins in embodying it and starting to apply it in your life. So I wish there was some way that I could deliver these mystical insights to you through a video or through speech or through writing, but it's just not possible. All right, so you're going to have to go do that. I've, I've given you many techniques in the past for how to do it. Psychedelics, yoga, meditation, contemplation, various breathing techniques, pranayamas and shamanic breathing and so forth. These might work. Some of these work better than others. You're going to have to experiment and find what works for you. But now we're moving on because I can't deliver the mystical experience to you here right now. 
So we're moving on with theory. And actually now we're getting to examples. Here are some examples of how self-love solves all problems. Let's take a look, for example, at insecurity. Now, these problems I'm going to be listing here, these are some of the most common problems that people have in personal development. Ordinary. I'm not talking about spiritual, lofty stuff. I'm not talking about enlightenment stuff now. I'm just talking about ordinary life. The kind of videos you want to see more of from me. The very practical stuff like, Leo, how do I get over my physical appearance? I don't like my physical appearance and I don't feel s secure and confident in myself. Leo, how do I get over having a small dick because I don't feel secure and my dick isn't as big as I want it to be. Or Leo, you know, I have low self-esteem and because of this, I keep getting into bad relationships. Or Leo, I'm not confident. I'm shy. How do I, how do I become confident around people and stop being so shy? How do I stop uh, being so introverted and be more extroverted? How do I get better at attracting women? Leo, how do I attract that husband that I want, that nice, you know, high quality, stable man in my life who's not just going to leave me for some bimbo? How do I, how do I find that guy? Leo, how do I manage my disagreements with people in my family? We keep fighting with each other. Leo, what about my intimate relationships? I keep getting into bad relationships and nothing keeps working and my partner doesn't listen to me and he's abusive to me and these sorts of problems, right? So what I'm saying is that these, the solution to all of these is ultimately self-love. So how does that work? Well, it's a little bit more obvious with insecurity or low self-esteem, for example. Literally, low self-esteem is a lack of love of yourself. That's literally what it is. <laughs> if you're worried about your physical appearance, you think your nose is too big, your teeth are too crooked, or you don't like some freckle on your face or whatever it is, some feature of your body. Most of us, you know, have something about our bodies that we wish was better. And then we live with that for our whole life and we suffer through it. Every time we look in the mirror, it's like, oh man, my nose, my eyes, my ears are too long or whatever it is for you. Hair isn't the way you want it to be. Luckily, I don't have that problem. <laughs> um, so in this case, how do you apply self-love? Well, you see, you're never going to fix your low self-esteem externally. You're never going to fix your confidence problem or your physical appearance problem by changing your nose, changing your ears, changing your hair. I mean, you can try and people do do that, but it doesn't ultimately work. Because even if you fix one thing, there's still going to be something else about you that you can't fix. You can't fix everything. Even if you get a nose job, there's going to be something about you you can't change. See? And even if you do change it, and even if it looks good now, okay, maybe you do a lot of cosmetic work on your face. You spend thousands of dollars doing this stuff. And then you're like, well, Leo, look, I improved myself and now I have high self-esteem because finally I look the way I should. Okay, but what happens in 20 years when you lose your good looks due to just natural aging? What happens if you get in a car accident and uh, suffer some scar? What if you get some disease that creates some you know, disfigurement in your body or in your face? What, what then? Then you're, you're shattered. You see, you're shattered. You're going to be lower than you've were when you started because there are going to be situations in life where you can't change it some things you can change but a lot of things you can't change and up to this point in your life you've been playing the game of manipulating life to get the stuff that you want and then creating happiness that way but this is a, a fool's errand you can't always win with this strategy in fact you're guaranteed to lose Right? So if you really want to address the issue of low self-esteem, are you tired of having low self-esteem? Are you tired of worrying about your physical appearance every time you look in the mirror? Are you tired of not being confident around people because you worry that you're too short or that you're too hairy or that whatever? You're too bald. And because of this, you can't 
talk to that girl you want to talk to. She, she, she rejects you and this is how you feel and you don't feel good because when you go and you try on clothes at the, at the department store, you're putting on jeans, but they look fat on you because you're worried about your weight and all this sort of stuff. And it's just, you're going through this and this has been happening to your whole life basically. See, and then not only that, but then you judge other people as well. And then that creates suffering for you as well, because it's not only that you think that other people judge you for being fat or being ugly, you yourself judge other people for being fat and being ugly or whatever. Which of course, these are two sides of the same coin. If you didn't judge others, you wouldn't judge yourself. And if you didn't judge yourself, you wouldn't judge others. So here, what's necessary to really address this issue at the root is to really accept yourself. Start to accept yourself and not just accept yourself, but to realize the beauty of what you are. This machine, this biological machine made out of consciousness that you are, that you can see in the mirror when you see your reflection. This is an amazing creation. It's an amazing thing, but you overlook it because you're so busy with, uh, with these social games that you want to play. See, so here, self-love is the answer. But of course, you're not just loving yourself as a human body. That's of course a good starting place. And you know, you could actually literally practice this. You could stand in front of a mirror for five minutes every morning for the next month and just look at yourself in the mirror and just fall in love with yourself. That's a good exercise, practice that. Uh, but beyond that, to really fulfill the actualization of self-love here, you're gonna have to fall in love, not just with your physical body, because that's a small part of yourself. That's not the true self. That's a part of the self, but that's just a tiny piece of it. The true self is the entire universe. So literally when we're talking about self-love, we're talking about falling in love with the entire universe as it is, not as you fantasize it to be, but as it is. That of course includes your body, but that includes the body of your spouse, the body of your girlfriend or your boyfriend, um, and not just their body, but their personality, how they are. And not just that, but countries, political parties. Love that too, because these countries and political parties are also part of the self. They're part of the universe. Just replace the word self with the word universe. Is it a part of the universe? Well, everything is by definition. Then that is you. That is the true self. So love that. And what does it mean to love that? It means to look at it and to appreciate its beauty, to accept it, not only to accept it, but to embrace it and to recognize and to become conscious of how amazing it is, how magical it is that this thing exists and that this thing is you. Really what you're doing as you're practicing self-love, it's sort of like we're taking the same situation that's happening in the mirror every morning, you know, when you look at yourself. Um, and, you know, maybe sometimes you look in the mirror and you say, oh, I look, I look good today. I look handsome. I look attractive. I look sexy, whatever. You know, my, my ass looks good. My muscles look good. My, my face, you know, my, my beard looks good today. I've done my hair. It looks nice today. You know, that. And then for a brief moment, you like yourself. Maybe you even love yourself for a brief moment. Well, what I'm saying is that that we're trying to get that little sliver of love that you normally feel once a month or whatever. Um, in your life for a brief you know, second or, or for a minute, we're taking that. Or like, for example, when, when someone pays you a compliment, maybe some attractive person finds you attractive and they say, oh, I like your purse. I like your shoes. I like your, you know, well, <laughs> I like your face. <laughs> um, you know, people give, give you compliments. And then when you get that compliment, you feel really good because now you can love yourself because they gave a little love to you. Well, that we're taking that dynamic of looking in the mirror at ourselves and we're expanding that to the entire universe. You are the universe looking at itself. Everything is your own reflection. People, trees, cars, animals, countries, planets, stars, all of it is your own reflection. This is your own body or mind that you are inside of. The entire universe is part of your own mind. 
And so really what self-love is, is the practice of the appreciation of your infinite mind, which is generating this amazing show, this amazing dream that we're in, that it's generating. You're generating it. You don't know how you're generating it, but you are. And the more conscious you become, the more you realize how amazing it is that all of this is generated by you and is you. See, That then puts into proper perspective and context your physical body. Because so long as you're preoccupied and only looking at your physical body as yourself, there can't be a deep love there. Because you're judging your body as to what it can do for you. Like, well, can my body perform sex? Can my body attract the right man? Can my body land me a marriage? Can my body perform the kind of work it needs to do or whatever? This is all within the realm of survival. And this is not true love. This is all conditional love. What we're looking for here is unconditional love. Love for a thing simply for its existence not dependent on what it can do for you. So you can love a person because they do stuff for you that you like or that makes you feel good or that helps your survival. For example, many of you express your love to me, but you're not doing it because you actually unconditionally love me. You're doing it because I'm very useful for you in your journey to unravel the perplexity of life. The videos are useful. In that case, you love me. And then if I shoot a video that's not useful, and then you hate me. Or if I shoot a video that offends you, then you hate me. You see? this. So, so your love for me has nothing really to do with true love. Your love is not about me. It's about you. To truly love me would be to love me just for my being, for my existence. Um, now just expand that to the entire universe <laughs> and recognize that what you're really doing is you're not loving me. You're not loving some man or some woman or some, some amazing politician or whatever, or some rock star. What you're loving is your own self, disowned parts of yourself, right? So as your sense of self expands and your sense of love expands, they start to fill up and take notice of the entire universe until literally you become infinite and your identity becomes one with the whole universe and your love becomes unlimited and totally unconditional. And at that moment is when you reach your deepest awakening. And at that moment is when you feel uh, most complete, when you feel happiest, not just happy, but ecstasy, bliss, orgasmic uh, levels of, of joy. If you were able to love that deeply, but of course, most of us are not. And really now, when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about mystical states, right? This is not ordinary, uh, ordinary emotions. We're beyond ordinary emotions here. We're talking about mystical states. Um, it's not about feeling good in your body. That's not our goal. It's not our goal to always be feeling good about our own body or about the world. Our goal is to uh, be so conscious that we appreciate our consciousness creates the appreciation of all of these different elements of life and reality you see it's loving reality simply for the sake of reality not because of what it can do for us and not because there's any reason to and not because we want to feel good it's not even that we're just literally becoming conscious of how amazing something is so what I'm saying is that if you became so conscious that you were conscious, deeply conscious right in this moment of what existence is, of what your body is, of what I am, of what the universe is, if you really became fully conscious of that, you would feel deep, deep, deep love, existential love. But right now, you're not conscious of that. But of course, you've had these moments. Everyone has had these moments where you're looking at a beautiful sunset or you're looking up at the stars 
and you get the sense of profundity. You're looking at a giant mountain and you're looking at its size and you're so, it dwarfs you, right? You're looking at this epic mountain and it's just, it's amazing and you're like, wow. That's what I'm talking about. In that moment, what's happening is that your consciousness is registering something about the scope of what existence is that normally you don't register because you're just preoccupied with mundane bullshit, petty squabbles and meeting your basic needs. And so that, that feeling is lost, but it's not just a feeling. That feeling is a byproduct of your consciousness. See? Like, have you ever looked at an animal or at a living creature and just looked at it so so long and so deep that you just you marvel at this is an amazing creature it's not you're not looking at it like you would look at a dog or a cat normally or it's like oh it's a little pet that i can pet it's like no you're looking at this this is an an incredible bio organic machine which has taken billions of years to evolve and here it is and look at how amazing all of its hair is its whiskers and its ears and the way it moves and you just look at that it's like it's incredible what this thing is. It's not just a kitten. It's like, it's incredible what it is. It's not just cute. It could be an ugly, you know, quote unquote, ugly creature. It doesn't have to be some cute kitten. You can look at it and just appreciate it for what it is. Like you can look, for example, at the eye. In fact, maybe try this with your own iris. Go look in the mirror at how your own iris works and just how amazing it is in its structure, how beautiful it is. And, and even not just how it looks, which is, uh, can be amazing, especially if you have some nice, nicely colored eyes. Um, you can see that in your own eyes. But also look at how the pupil dilates. Like, it's amazing. You can just sit there in the mirror and just look at it for a few minutes, and you'll notice that it gets contracted and it expands. It's doing this. You could even, you know, uh, fade the lights in and out. You'll see the pupil changes, and it's doing all this automatically. Like, it's incredible that this is happening and you have no conscious control over this. You don't know how you're doing it, even though you believe it's you, you believe your eyes are part of you and you still have no idea how they actually work. What's controlling that dilation of the pupil? It's all happening on autopilot. It's so amazing. See? And then when you realize that, it's like, oh, wow, I really appreciate that, that thing that I didn't appreciate. I was taking it for granted. Well, this now applies to everything, you see? And what needs to happen there is a consciousness. So back to some more practical examples. Um, so you see, we're going from the practical to the sort of existential and then back again, because that is our work, is to bring the practical into the existential and vice versa and to, to merge the two together so that all the mundane stuff like cats and dogs and forks and knives and toilet paper, so that all of this gets recontextualized as... Uh, the miracle of consciousness, of spirit, which you've been taking for granted your whole life. So let's talk about how to apply self-love when it comes to dating and attraction. Many of you guys who watch me are struggling to attract females. Understandable. Something that I've faced myself. I think most guys face this problem in their life. So it's a very common problem. Um, of course, you ladies also struggle to attract the right kind of man and spouse uh, into your life. So, uh, so the problem with trying to attract women specifically is that you're doing it from a place that lacks self-love. You're trying to get from the woman something as the guy. You're trying to impress her. You're trying to extract sex from her. You're trying to manipulate her to like you, to go on a date with you, to sleep with you, to be with you. And, and all this, and this becomes a very frustrating game. You start to, you know, go out there, start hitting on girls, and 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 so forth. And you keep failing. You don't know why do I keep failing? Why don't they like me? Well, a big component of it is that you don't like yourself. How can they like you when you don't like yourself? See, women are really good at reading off of you as the guy whatever you're feeling subconsciously. So when you lack self-love, the woman smells that off you. 
because your tone of voice is weak. It's not confident. She reads that off you within seconds. Your eyes are shifty. They're not steady and focused. Your smile, you don't have a smile because you're afraid when you're talking to her and you're anxious and you're nervous. Um, and all this sub communicates to the woman that you're a weak guy. And the reason you're a weak guy is because you lack self-love. But it goes even deeper than that. You might say, oh, Leo, well, I, I did a bunch of pickup and I slept with a hundred girls and now I love myself and I think I'm the, I'm the boss. You know, I got the big dick and I walk into the club and I, I hit on all the girls and I pull home a girl at night and at the end of the night and I'm, it's amazing and I'm so good. And Leo, I fulfilled your self-love <laughs> imperative. No, you haven't. You're just being a narcissistic dick. See, that's not true self-love. Because what you're still lacking is, again, your sense of self is still this limited pickup identity that you've created as a man. That's not the true self. True self-love here would be to be so loving that you love all women as a whole. You love every woman that you're with. You don't try to manipulate her because if you truly were practicing self-love, you couldn't practice manipulation. You, see, you actually care not about her as a sex object to satisfy your needs, but you actually care about her needs. You care about her agenda. You care about her feelings, what she's thinking, what she wants, what kind of life she wants to create with you, what kind of relationship you guys are in. See, that's a very different dynamic than what most pickup people are doing. You can be great at attracting women, but you're still... You're going to be failing over and over again. You're not going to be satisfied. I, I've, I've known guys who are so good at pickup that they slept with 200, 300 women. They can go on any uh, busy night on a weekend. They can go to a club and they can th their chances of pulling a girl uh, are really high. Shockingly high. <laughs> Disturbingly high. <laughs> um, uh, but I don't, I don't envy these people because they're not satisfied. They're not satisfied and they don't know what to do about it. They think that they already have self-love. No, you don't have self-love. Your self-love is so limited because your sense of self is so limited and your sense of love is so limited. And the reason that is is because you haven't had these mystical experiences that need to be had in order to understand what self and love really are. Now, for you ladies who struggle to attract a high quality man, uh, who's going to stick around and be stable and want to commit to you, right? That's what you want, most of you. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, a lot of you can't do that because you have very low self-esteem. You don't love yourself enough. And then, of course, the man reads that off of you. It's very easy for a man to, to tell when a, when, when a woman isn't confident about herself, her appearance, or other aspects of her life. And then many men will not hesitate to manipulate and to take advantage of that. So in both these instances, the males and the females, both of us need to learn self-love. And then your relationships will go a lot better. In fact, you might even <laughs> you might even reach such a high level of self-love that you won't even need sex or relationships anymore because those will actually limit your ability to just radiate self-love. But of course, most people aren't there, so there's nothing wrong with some sex or some relationships to uh, hold you over until you get there. How about disagreements with family and other people? What's missing when these disagreements happen? In fact, in general, when arguments of any kind happen, what's really happening is a lack of self-love is being exhibited by usually both sides. Sometimes one side more than the other, but in general, both sides are guilty of it. It's just a question of degree. See, you want to get along well with people without arguing, without harsh disagreements, practice more self-love. Again, what this means is that you're not just loving yourself in the argument, which everybody does. That's what the ego does all the time. 
you're loving the other party as well because you recognize that there's nothing special about you. There's nothing special about your position in this argument. Your position is just as important as their position from a sort of a metaphysical perspective, right? When you're coming from a loving place, many of these arguments and disagreements melt away. A lot of families get destroyed by this. Maybe your own mother and father, chances are quite good, probably 50% chance that they got divorced. Why did they get divorced? Uh, lack of self-love, ultimately. See, probably your father couldn't fully love himself and your mother, and your mother probably couldn't fully love herself and your father. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that getting a divorce is wrong per se. Uh, you could decide to get a divorce, and that could also be an act of self-love. So self-love does not mean that you stay in an abusive relationship and that you love the abusive guy even though he keep, keeps abusing you and uh, ruining your life. <laughs> no. See, if you fully love yourself, you would understand that to honor my my full self and to to honor my capacity to love others and to love myself and to have respect for myself, I need to set some boundaries. And this person, if he keeps crossing these boundaries, then the most loving thing in this situation is not to keep being with him, but to cut it off and move on with my life. Because otherwise, I'm going to be stuck in an abusive relationship. And what kind of self-love is that? Is that loving yourself to create justifications for staying in an abusive relationship? That's not self-love. If you really loved yourself, you would want the best for yourself. Not in the short term, but in the long term. You'd want yourself to grow. See? You'd want your partner to grow. How about the problem of dealing with death, suffering, illness, injury, wrongdoing, injustice that's done to you? How do you deal with these problems? Again, these problems arise because of a lack of self-love. If you get a serious illness, what you need more than anything is self-love. Now, of course, you can take medication and chemotherapy and so forth, and maybe that'll help you, maybe it won't. It's a dicey game. Uh, but regardless, you're going to heal much faster with self-love. Uh, of course, you can still take the medication and so forth, but uh, having self-love in that situation is critical for your battle with this cancer or whatever. And even if you lose the battle, I'm not saying that just by loving yourself, you're going to win the battle and you're now you're immune to cancer. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Um, but you need to be kind to yourself, appreciate yourself, be understanding of your situation. Like, if you, let's say, break a leg, uh, you can react to it with anger and hatred and say, oh, God damn it, how could I be so clumsy and so stupid? I tripped over that banana peel and broke my leg. Oh my God, this is terrible. You can do that whole thing, which then robs you of the resources you need to, to be able to, to deal with the situation and to recover better. Whereas if you're understanding and you understand that, well, yeah, of course, yeah, I slipped on that banana peel. It's kind of silly, but also, you know, yeah, we all do silly things sometimes. I can, I can appreciate that I do silly things. Other people do silly things. Let me love the fact that I do silly things. Other people do silly things. We're all clumsy sometimes. Sure, I, I, this was a stupid thing, but, but let me just, let me love it. Let me, let me learn from it. What kind of lessons are there here? See, that's a much uh, healthier attitude and that will lead you to a faster recovery and to better things. And in fact, that breaking of the leg, even though it'll hurt um, and it'll be inconvenient for a while, it, you might learn some profound spiritual lessons from that about suffering, about pain, about maybe empathizing with others. Now, when you see somebody else with a cast, now you empathize with them. See, it helps you to be more loving to suffer. Um, or when, when some injustice is done to you, you can judge it and hate it and resist it and demonize it, or you can embrace it with love. 
you can realize that the the one who is doing injustice to you is none other than you from an existential perspective, right? The universe is doing this to itself. So when, if someone broke into your car and stole some stuff, this actually happened to me. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this up because it actually happened to me a couple of years ago. I was driving with my ex-girlfriend. We were on a hiking trip. We drove through uh, Fresno. Yeah, I think it was Fresno, California. <clears throat> And we just stopped there for the night. And my car was packed to the roof and to all, all the seats and all the trunk. Everything was packed with gear because we were on a, on a, like a hiking trip. It was kind of uh, late fall, so it was cold. So we had jackets and boots and all sorts of stuff. And then, um, yeah, somebody broke into my car and stole everything. <laughs> and I remember, I, I, I remember like it was painful for a few days after that event, especially the day of the event, like it was almost like someone like stabbed me in the heart by stealing all this stuff. Like they stole my GoPro camera. They stole, I had this, I had some fishing gear with me. I had this tackle box of fishing supplies. That's like probably 20 years old. I've had it since I was like a kid with my dad. We would go on fishing trips. Like this had a lot of sentimental value to me. I had like old fishing lures and stuff like that in there. And like, this is irreplaceable stuff. I had a, like a little notebook of every fish that I caught, like recorded in there. Like, like this is decades old and some, <laughs> some ass stole this, stole this fishing box and all my stuff. Um, so yeah, it was heartbreaking. But then also what helped me is that at that moment, you know, I, I was, I was conscious enough. I understood enough of these principles of spirituality and self-actualization and so forth that I tried to actually empathize with the person. So rather than hating him, actually in, 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 that, in that incident, I discovered that Fresno, Fresno, California is apparently the meth capital of the world. So there's a lot of meth addicts there. It's, it's a terrible situation. Um, they have a lot of um, these sort of carjackings and car break-ins because everyone there is like hooked on meth and opioids maybe as well. And um, yeah, it's just a terrible, terrible situation. And they don't know what to what to do to help these addicts. So when I thought about that, I actually thought about how, oh, okay, so this must have been like a, a meth a desperate meth addict who broke into my car and you know, yeah, okay, he he stole some stuff. He stole my jacket, my favorite jacket, um, and some of my clothes and my blankets. But then I'm thinking, like, well, but now he's probably sitting there in the cold in my jacket with my blanket. At least he gets that out of it, you know, gets a little bit of uh, relief of his suffering there. And I can totally understand why he would do that because meth is very addictive. And so in this sense, you know, um, I was practicing self-love there by, by empathizing with the situation and seeing it not just from my personal ego perspective, but seeing it from a sort of a universal perspective. So it's actually quite sad, not for me personally, that my stuff was stolen. It's quite sad just as a condition of the social system in America that we have all these opioid addicts and drug addicts, meth addicts on the streets, living homeless. They don't have care. Nobody, the government's not helping them. Um, the, neither political party really wants to help them with poverty and the way capitalism works and all this, you know, they're just living outdoors in the cold, suffering, dying, overdosing, um, catching HIV and so forth with these needles and whatever else. Like that whole situation is very sad. Love that. That is you. That is yourself. That is the universe. That's what it is. Love that. That's self-love. When you, when you can connect with that, if you can connect with that, if you can have that level of detachment and perspective, that level of consciousness, and this takes consciousness, then it's very hard for people to do you wrong. This is the ultimate antidote here. Now, granted, it's difficult to practice this. How about the problem of killing yourself at work by overworking? How many of you are workaholics? I know your type. So, this is a very practical problem. People ruin their health by working too much. Eating junk food at work. Chugging down Cokes and Diet Cokes and 
Snicker bars and all this nonsense, Cheetos and Doritos and all this shit, you're destroying your body, see? So you're not practicing self-love at work. You think you love your work, but really, that's a very limited definition of love there. If you were really practicing self-love in this situation, you would love not just a little sliver of your work, but you would love also and recognize the importance of the entire situation. So it's not just that there's work that needs to be done and money that needs to be made. It's like, no, there's work that needs to be done. There's money that needs to be made. I'm also doing it because I'm passionate about it. Uh, also, my body needs to feel comfortable and good doing it. I need to feel well rested so that I can be at my most creative. I love being creative. So if you truly loved yourself, you would not want to put yourself in a situation where you are working 80 hour weeks, uh, doing grunt labor and just chugging stuff out and killing yourself and your body and your emotions in the process and maybe even your family and all this. If you truly loved yourself, you wouldn't put yourself in that situation and you could correct that. You could find new ways of working or different types of jobs, or entirely different careers, you see? So this self-love, you might wonder, well, Leo, it's so impractical. But it's not impractical when you have a very robust understanding of, 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 of this concept and how to apply it. See, it's not impractical at all. What I'm telling you is that any problem you have in your life, look at that problem and then apply this robust notion of self-love. Expand your sense of self in that situation. Expand your sense of love. And then ask yourself, okay, what should I do next? Practically, what should I do about this? See. For example, let's say you're working at a nine to five job that you hate. Starbucks or Subway or someplace. And you just, you detest this job. You got to get up every morning. You're barely there. You're not motivated. You're, you hate yourself. You feel like you're trapped and you're in a corner and all this. But you got to do it for the money, right? So, in this situation, now you're feeling bad. You might even start to feel depressed. You might even contemplate suicide if this goes long enough, for, you know, for 10, 20 years. Um, so what's the solution? Self-love. Expand your self-love. What does that practically mean? Well, if you really loved yourself, would you keep working at that job? If you really loved yourself, could you muster up a vision, a new vision of a new job, a new career, a new, a new way you could retrain yourself? Of course you could. You see, but you need that vision. Where does a vision come from? From love. You need to have a new love, something you're passionate about. You're not going to get out of that miserable situation unless there's some extra passion that you have that can motivate you and push you through some difficult time to get over that hump. So maybe you're going to have to work two jobs now because you now you expand your sense of self-love and you say, okay, I, I'm really passionate about making music. That's what I really want to do, but I don't know how to get there. So Leo, how is self-love going to help me with that? I'd need more money, not more love. But to get more money, you need first more love and a, a deeper sense of self. Because right now, you're little, how did you get in this shitty situation in the first place? See, by lack of self-love. The reason you work at a Subway or a Starbucks is because you didn't spend time earlier in your childhood, in your youth, really loving yourself and developing a sense of passion about life. Because if you did that, I guarantee you, you would never end up in a Starbucks or a, a Subway. See, people who get there, they get there by accident because they didn't plan anything, they didn't have any passions. They didn't really follow through on it. See? They didn't have a large enough sense of self, a large enough sense of mission, and a large enough sense of life purpose. Where does life purpose come from? From self-love. You have to love yourself so much. You have to love reality so much that you want to contribute to it in a meaningful way. Not by working at Subway. And, uh, and so... Um, if you want to get out of that situation, what you're going to have to do, and like literally I, I did this, is I worked double. I had my main job, nine to five job, and then on the weekends and at night I would come home and I would work double to start my own business. But the reason I could do that 
is because I had a vision, I had a passion, I had a love for myself and a, I knew my own potential and I knew that I wasn't living up to my potential. And my potential I knew was so great that I knew that staying at this nine to five job uh, was, was just unacceptable. It was unacceptable. I loved myself too much to accept that. And then from there, that led to a lot of good stuff. See? A lot of very practical stuff. Money came from that. I made hundreds of thousands of dollars that are sitting in my bank account from uh, a higher sense of self-love than most people, which enabled me to have a a deeper sense of life purpose than most people, which enabled me to work harder than most people, which enabled me to be more creative than most people, which ena enabled me to be more passionate uh, in my work than most people, which allowed me then to um, become financially independent. That's how you do it. Expanding your sense of self-love. What about if you have fear of starting a business? Seems like a very practical situation. It's like, Leo, I want to start a business, but I'm afraid. I don't know. What if I'm going to go broke and so forth? What are you going to need to overcome that? More love. You're not going to overcome fear with fear. Fear is overcome with love. You're going to have to love your idea for your business so much. You're going to have to love your vision so much. You're going to have to have such a sense of purpose that this business is really going to change the world in some meaningful way that you believe in. And the only reason you can, you can motivate yourself like that is because you have to really genuinely love the world, love reality. If, you're not, if you don't love reality, if you don't love the world, if you don't love life, if you don't love human beings, how can you create a business that helps them? And if you don't create a business that helps them, what are you going to do? You're going to create a business that hurts them? Well, good luck creating a successful business that hurts people. Now, of course, that still doesn't stop uh, certain big pharma companies and <laughs> big oil companies. Um, they, it is actually possible, you know, Wall Street and so forth. It is possible to start a business that is successful and that hurts people, but first of all, it's not a sustainable business. All those businesses will go out of business uh, pretty soon, within a matter of decades. Um, and also, it's a terrible way to, to live life. Because even when you win, you lose. Even if you get all that money, you're still going to be miserable and depressed. The only way to really win at business is to create a business that helps people. That's your payoff for business. The payoff for, for a great business is not the money. It's the smile you put on people's faces. That's the payoff, if you're doing it correctly. And to, to, to have that motivation, you need to really love yourself and really love other people and love reality. See? So, actually, the reason that many of these um, um, sleazy business people types, these sort of Wall Street types, or these sort of scammers that run Ponzi schemes and so on, the Bernie Madoffs and so forth, um, some of these sleazy CEOs and you know who take giant, um, you know, uh, compensation packages and so forth, these people they're not conscious people. These are miserable people. They might seem flashy and successful on the surface, but deep down, they're miserable people. They're empty. They're hollow inside. And the reason that is, is because they don't really love mankind. They don't love the world as much as I do, for example. So they are happy working in a job where they are just uh, scamming others or exploiting others, manipulating others, whatever. They're happy doing that. Whereas like, I would never be able to sustain that because my love is too high. <laughs> See, I love myself too much and I love the world too much to do that. I don't want to start a business like that. Uh, but many people, they don't care. So how do you get yourself out of that situation? If you're one of those types who right now has a job where you're not really doing any good for mankind, in fact, you're probably doing something bad, like you're selling them sugary drinks, working at Pepsi or something. If you're some uh, VP of marketing at Pepsi, for you to get to the next level in your human evolution and in your happiness, 
and to be able to be a good father to your children and a good spouse to your wife and all this, what need what you need to have have happen is you need to raise your level of self-love, expand your sense of self beyond your family, beyond money, beyond having a car and a house, expand it to include mankind as well. The environment, animals, all that. Expand your sense of self and expand your ability to love so you're not just stuck in your head calculating numbers, figuring out how to squeeze and manipulate people and sell them more sugary drinks and ruin their health. But you gotta love people so much that you become so conscious that you realize that why am I ruining the lives of millions of children selling this sugary drink when instead I could be putting my brain power and my creative vision into coming up with a new beverage that might be healthy, a healthy alternative that would actually help all those kids and you know help millions of people to wean themselves off of soda, which is causing obesity and cancer and uh, God knows what else, diabetes and so forth. See, but the only way you can make that evolutionary leap is by expanding your sense of self-love. So really, if you're wor working at one of these, um, um, uh, for lack of a better, better word, uh, devil jobs, uh, one of these devil jobs, you're lacking self-love. Your self is too small and your love is too small. And you're so preoccupied with business and with money and marketing and sales you're not leaving any room open to inquire into the metaphysics of reality, into spirituality. You're not leaving yourself time to meditate, to contemplate, to do psychedelics, to go on a retreat in the rainforest because you're so busy selling your stupid fucking uh, soda so that you can make next quarter's you know, benchmark of profits and then you could get a little bit more of a compensation package, some more stock options or whatever it is that you don't even need anymore because you've already got enough, way more than you need to be fulfilled. Uh, but you can't help yourself. Why? Because you're afraid. And the solution to fear is self-love. If you have money problems, this is a self-love problem. I know it sounds ridiculous. It sounds new agey to say this. Because what could be more utilitarian than a money problem? Leo, those poor kids in Africa, they have a money problem. They have an infrastructure problem. They have a HIV problem. They don't have a love problem. But all those problems are love problems. To have money, you need to have a right economy. To have a right economy, you need a right society. To have the right society, you need to have no tribal warfare. To have no tribal warfare, people need to respect each other. People need to be open-minded. People need to be able to listen to each other. That requires self-love. An expanded sense of self, an expanded sense of love. Many of the most impoverished parts of the world are parts which are crippled by corruption and by tribalism and by ideology. These create a sort of a, a trifecta that's really difficult to resolve. And that creates a really bad econ economic situation with little economic opportunity and uh, and then, of course, yeah, of course, in that situation, yeah, they need money. But how are we going to solve this? Are we going to solve the, this money problem by just dropping buckets of, of cash from the skies? It's not going to work. Because even if you did that, in these countries, they are so corrupt, so tribal, and so ideological that even when the UN airdrops in food supplies and aid and all this sort of stuff, the local dictator or the clan leader in the region will just take all that uh, food stuff and he, he will sell it and just make a profit for himself. It won't even go to the hungry kids. So 
what's the problem there? Well, part of the problem is that these clan leaders, uh, they're usually tyrannical. Um, they basically run a mafia and they're totally corrupt and they're authoritarian. Why is that? Because they're extremely selfish. Their sense of self is very limited and their sense of love is very limited. See, they're wrapped up in survival. Now, of course, I'm not blaming them for that. That's just how it is. And you need to love that as well. Um, but but the only way that situation is going to change is if that nation changes its culture, changes its society so that there's an expanded sense of self. First, what that's going to entail is that the two or three or four factions that are engaging in this feudal clan warfare with each other, they need to expand their sense of self such that they recognize that, wait a minute, guys, we're a unified country. We're not four different tribes. We're one country. We're one people. We have more in common than we have that differentiates us. It's like uh, uh, the different factions of Muslims, the Sunnis and the Shiites and so forth, they realize that, oh, we're all actually Muslims. Let's get together and actually create a, a Muslim society. That would be one step up. Then the next step up for them would be to realize like, oh, it's not that just we're Muslims and then they they over there are Christians or they over there are atheists and infidels. It's like, no, we're Muslims and they're Christians and, and, and they're atheists, but that's all me. That's all myself. So myself expands to include all that. So now all of a sudden, as a Muslim, I don't have to fight with the Christians and the atheists. I can realize that, oh, well, people have different perspectives and ultimately in the end, it all, still all leads to self-love. See, and then you could expand even further beyond that. So that's how ultimate, that's the root solution to many of those problems. Of course, that's difficult to do. I'm not saying it's easy. It can't just be done on a purely individual level. It has to be done on a collective level as well. Um, but that would be a way to go about it. How about political problems? Problems with government? Problems in international relations? Well, obviously, these are self-love problems. I hope you can see this. Almost all political problems are a debate between two sides. These two sides hate each other misunderstand each other, do not listen to each other, are closed-minded to each other's perspectives and needs and different levels of, uh, of development. And so then, of course, there's, there's combat and warfare and dirty politics and tricks and manipulation and selfishness and devilry and corruption and all this. See? How do you overcome that? How do we as Americans, for example, in America, overcome this polarized time that we're living in with Trump and the different factions of Democrats that are all fighting with each other and all this. How do we resolve this? By expanding our sense of self. And loving the whole situation more, loving the other side more. As sappy as that sounds, that is a problem. Is that there's not enough self-love going around in this time. See? And that's that's perhaps the, 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 the biggest tragedy of, of Trump's influence on American politics and even global politics is that he infected it with his own lack of self-love. See? Pitting people against each other, pitting factions against each other, demonizing anybody who disagrees with him, demonizing um, anyone who stands in his way. Of course, Democrats are also guilty of that to some extent, but Trump is the king of that. <laughs> How about if you're doing spirituality? You're meditating a lot, you're doing solo retreats, you're doing psychedelics, you're doing yoga, but you're not getting the results you want. It's taking longer than you thought, you're having ego backlashes, you're backsliding, you're, you're struggling to meditate, uh, you keep falling off track, and what's the solution? Is it to hate yourself more? No, it's self-love. More self-love. Be more kind to yourself. Be more understanding. Be more loving of the entire spiritual process. Don't just be meditating just to meditate like a machine, like a robot. M enjoy the meditation. See, why aren't you loving your meditation session? The whole point of meditation is to get you into self-love, but the way you're doing meditation is so mechanical and so regimented and so 
empty of love, that, of course, how are you going to get there? If you have a bad trip on a psychedelic, what do you do? Do you go cry about it? No. More self-love. Now, of course, crying could be a part of self-love. Nothing wrong with crying. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the only thing you need after a bad trip is more self-love. And the only reason the bad trip happened in the first place is because of a lack of self-love. Because the trip was trying to expand your sense of self and expand your sense of love, but your ego was so scared, it was holding on, it was resisting, uh, or maybe you overdosed or whatever because you were careless. In which case, uh, it was too much, right? <laughs> the self-love became so great that it actually turned into hell because you weren't prepared for it. You know? So what's the solution to that? More self-love. After a bad trip, the best thing you can do is wrap yourself in a warm blanket, make yourself some hot cocoa, sit by the fire, um, or just go out, look at the stars, maybe chat with some good friends, have some laughs, maybe watch a comedy, whatever, this sort of stuff. But you're not going to be able to do that if you're going to be hating on yourself or worrying. You see, worrying, hate, fear, these put you into very unresourceful states from which you make stupid decisions and you don't do the obvious things, little practical things that could soothe your situation and bring you out on top. And then mistakes happen. For example, you have a bad trip, and because you don't love yourself enough, you're not able to soothe yourself and console yourself properly after that, you're not able to heal and get over it. You know, you, you're left wounded, and then you say no to psychedelics forever. And then you miss out on this amazing entire domain that could have transformed your life. You say no to it. Why? Because you didn't love yourself enough. Violence, crime, mass shootings, terrorism, racism, abuse. How do we deal with this sort of criminality? By hating it? By judging it? Of course not. This, look, the worse your problem is, the more self-love you need. The problem is, is that when your problems are really serious, you're least likely to take self-love seriously. You're more likely to say, oh, Leo, but you're just talking airy-fairy bullshit. No, I'm not. It's just really hard to do. And when things get really bad, like you have terrorism or mass shootings and violence and racism and so forth, yeah, the reason that situation is so bad is because it lacks so much self-love. And it needs a massive infusion of self-love. But of course, the ego, when it has little self-love, it, it can't tolerate a lot of self-love infused into it. It literally has a sort of a backlash, bad trip reaction. So if you really are serious, as if we're serious as a society, we want to stop all these mass shootings. If we want to stop violence, if we want to stop poverty and terrorism, what do we do? Self-love. And all the ways that manifests. If you really expanded your sense of self to include the terrorists, to include the mass shooter, you would be able to empathize with their situation and understand how they got to where they are. See? That doesn't mean we have to allow it to happen. Uh, but you can understand more properly why it's happening. Why are people so upset with their lives that they're willing to go into a school and shoot up children. That's not just some random thing, you see. That, that something has to be seriously wrong in society such that we don't support all citizens properly, such that some of them fall through the cracks so deeply that then they uh, uh, become suicidal this way and take others with them. See? So really, if we cared about this, we would create a sort of a safety net that would catch a mechanism that would catch those people that are falling through the cracks. We would identify what the cracks are. We would actually be curious enough because we would empathize with them rather than just saying that, oh, they're just psychos or they're just scumbags. If you treat them as psychos and scumbags, you can't solve the problem. You can't help them. You're blaming them for the problem when really maybe the problem isn't them, but it's their environment. It's their conditioning. 
It's what they've been taught. It's how their mother or father abused them. And the reason their mother or father abused them is because they didn't get the proper parenting education. Or maybe because the mother was in such poverty, she had to work three different jobs. She didn't have time to spend with her child when he was young. She couldn't afford daycare for him. And so he grew up with the wrong kind of, uh, you know, gangs and then whatever. And then, you know, got into drugs and got into other things. And then that led to, um, to a bad situation that spiraled out of control. See? So all these things, especially when we're talking about these large social problems that keep recurring again and again and again, like mass shootings and terrorism and, and racism, these are systemic problems. They happen because the way that our society is structured is creating as a function of its structure these side effects, if you will. So we need to look and change the structure. But to be able to change the structure, we have to be able to expand our sense of self and expand our sense of love. How about the environmental problem that we have? Is our problem that we're pumping out too much CO2? I mean, it is from a sort of a technical scientific perspective with global warming. But the deeper problem is a lack of self-love. That's why we're pumping out the CO2, even though most people know that pumping out this much CO2 isn't good. The giant oil companies have known about this since the 1970s. They had their own internal reports where their own scientists knew that this would be a, a future possibility, a future problem they had to deal with. But they did it anyways. Why is that? Because the people that run these companies don't actually love the environment. They don't love animals. They love money more. And that's because their sense of self doesn't incorporate animals and environment. Instead, they go hunt animals for trophies on safari. Um, that's how they show their quote-unquote love for animals. But of course, you wouldn't do that if you really loved animals, if you really expanded your sense of self to include them in the environment. See? Most people take the environment for granted. They don't, they don't actually treat the environment as they treat their own body or you know some people treat their own body so bad that that's exactly how they treat the environment which shows you how deep the problem goes if if one third of americans are obese which i think is is roughly correct um although don't quote me on that then um and of course yeah is, is this a surprise that we treat our environment so bad when we can't even treat our own bodies well And, but is it the fault of the obese people? No, it's not their fault per se. Um, again, it's, it's all part of the system because of all the fast food, the soda, the drinks, the marketing of food, bad food that happens on TV all the time with no consequences. See? I would bet that 90% of the stuff that's marketed on TV and on YouTube could no longer be marketed if only the people that were marketing it expanded their sense of self-love. The only reason they can market it is because they don't love themselves and they don't know what the self really is. What's the solution to depression and suicide? Self-love. What's the solution to addiction? Self-love. What's the solution to various ideological disagreements? Self-love. What's the solution to parenting problems? More self-love. You think that your child is unruly and causing problems and not getting good grades and hanging out with the wrong kids and that really like, Leo, no, my child's problem is that he's, he's hanging out with the wrong bad influences and they're going to get him into drugs and other things. That's the real problem, not a... Uh, self-love problem but the reason your child is so disconnected from you is because you've been nagging him and criticizing him his whole life telling him how bad he is and what he's not supposed to do but then he's developed this rebellious streak he he doesn't even communicate with you anymore because 
you weren't able to see and love him for who he is. And now this alienation has created, and you're going to have to work extra hard to overcome that alienation. How do you overcome that alienation? Through more self-love. And the reason you judge your child and point out all the wrong things that he's doing, how foolish he is and how he's doing all the obviously dumb stuff, the reason you're doing that is because you yourself are so self-judgmental and you hate yourself so much. And you don't accept all these aspects that are in your child, that you see in your child. Those are all the aspects that you've denied in yourself. That's your shadow. So you're projecting your shadow and you're, you're, you're projecting your shadow onto that child. And what that child really wants is love. But since you're not providing it, his friends are providing it. The drugs are providing it. His, you know, toxic girlfriend is providing it. His gang is providing it. The tattoos he gets, that's providing it. Because you couldn't provide it. Yeah, that's tough. It's tough. It's real tough for a parent to admit that they don't actually like their child. Because it's like, it's supposed to be automatic that, oh, everybody loves their child. And in a certain sense, you love your child. But in another sense, yeah, you love your child, or at least you say you do, but you don't, you don't accept them unconditionally. Which is the number one mistake of parenting, is not accepting your child unconditionally. And that's because you don't know how to, because you haven't accepted yourself unconditionally. A lot of these problems would autocorrect if you expanded your sense of self-love. So I want you to notice that every time that you're not happy in whatever situation, doesn't matter what context, self-love is lacking in that situation. What's the most important thing you can teach your children? Self-love. What's the most important thing for a successful relationship? Self-love. What's the most important thing for artists, creative types, and even business people, successful business people? What's the most important thing? Self-love. What's the most important thing for conscious politics, as I've talked about in my four-part series, for that to work? Self-love. What's the most important thing for leading other people? Self-love. If you don't love yourself, you can't lead others. If you don't love yourself, you can't be a great artist or be great at creativity. And you can't be a great business person. You might think that, no, Leo, that's not true. There's a lot of people who hate themselves but are good at business, who are very narcissistic and selfish. But think of how much greater they could have been at business if they love themselves more. Being great at business is not measured by how much money you make. Being great at business is measured by the impact your business makes on the world. So I don't care if some Wall Street type runs a hedge fund that earns $100 million a year. That's not being great at business. Because that hedge fund is just leeching money without offering any serious value. It's not creative work. To be really successful in business is somebody who's contributing something new to the world and is passionate about the work that they do and isn't it just doing it mechanically for money or some external reward. Someone who is putting smiles on people's faces. Not at the expense of others, but um, in, a, in a truly win-win sort of way, in a constructive way, not a destructive way. Because, you know, it's easy to put smiles on on, on the faces of some, uh, some rich person by, you know, getting them a lot of return through your hedge fund. But then that comes at the expense of all, all the other people you stepped on in order to take their money. Because that's a zero-sum game there. Uh, what's the most important thing for healing and helping other people? Self-love. What's the most important thing for dealing with criminals and evil? Self-love. No amount of money, success, fame, a house, sex, a family, or beauty, physical appearance, I mean, 
can compensate for a lack of self-love. And people desperately try and try and try and to manipulate to get all those other things, but fundamentally they're lacking self-love, but they don't realize that. Because when you lack self-love, you don't know that you lack self-love. And actually you're in denial about it. You think that what you really lack is some external material circumstance, like money or a house. So there cannot be happiness without self-love. And that basically means that the whole spiritual path boils down to learning self-love. Self-love is the ultimate strength and the ultimate power. So this is how you judge the development level of a human being, is how deeply is he or she able to self-love? And uh, it's really just as simple as that. But why is this the case? Why is self-love so powerful? Because it's the ultimate truth. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's an absolute. It's what reality is. Is self-love. Consciousness, the only substance that exists, out of which every universe and multiverse is made, out of which every physical object is made, consciousness. This consciousness, which is right here, right now, constructing this very moment. This consciousness is the same consciousness that's constructing all possible moments. And this consciousness is in love with itself. Constructing this grand, infinite dream. That is the very essence of what consciousness is. Anything less than total self-love is falsehood, corruption, and delusion. Separation and division and partiality and bias. To reject any part of yourself or reality is ignorance, foolishness, fear, and uh, coming from limited consciousness. So this infinite mind, which is God, which is this present moment and all possible moments that ever will or have occurred, this is what it is. It is pure consciousness. And God is equivalent to self-love. Now you might wonder why. Why would reality love itself? Leo, couldn't reality just be a physical thing? Why do you have to bring love into it? See, this is, this is your question from the materialist paradigm. I get you. I understand the hesitation and the concern and the doubt. Um, here's, here's why. <laughs> what you don't understand is that reality has to be itself. A thing can't be itself and at the same time not be itself. It has to fully be itself. So really to say that reality loves itself and that God is self-love, all that is being said is basically that A equals A. If we have A, A has to be A. A can't be B. A can't be C. A has to be A. So if we have all of reality as a whole, think of it as one particle. If we compress the entire universe into a single particle and we look at it from afar, which we can't do, but if we could, like this, that little dot that contains every possible thing that exists, that little dot is precisely what it is. A equals A. That dot is the dot. And that is the love. Because this little dot is occurring within consciousness. Consciousness, if it's fully conscious, has to be conscious of the fact that it's conscious and what it is to be conscious and everything that is within the contents of its consciousness. To be conscious is simply the unfolding of self-love. So, an infinite consciousness, which is what God refers to, an infinite consciousness cannot hate itself, judge itself, reject itself, or wish ill on itself, or exclude itself, because that would be insanity. It would be like A denying that it's A. 
So from God's point of view, here's how God looks at it. I am God. I am exactly what I am. I am a complete necessity, a complete tautology. I can't be anything other than what I am, which is infinite consciousness. As infinite consciousness, I have to be exactly how I am, which means that I have to accept myself exactly as I am. That is, in other words, the truth. The truth accepts itself as the truth. See, The truth can't deny itself what it is because the truth is just what is. So what is has to is. <laughs> And now we're reaching rock bottom, below which there's nothing. Um, you can't get any lower than isness. So isness just is. Consciousness is. But to, is is not just the way you imagine as a materialist. You imagine, that, well, Leah, we can, can't we just have like some material universe out there somewhere outside of consciousness, outside of God? Who cares about God and all this love? None of this matters. What if there's just like a material universe and it just exists well let's go with that let's imagine a scenario where there is no consciousness whatsoever let's imagine a universe with no consciousness there's only what you would call matter dumb lifeless unconscious matter so what's going on here you might have planets and stars and so forth but no humans and no animals, let's say, for simplicity's sake. So in this situation that you're imagining, you just imagine that, well, that could just exist, right? It could just be like that with no consciousness, no love, nothing. Is, there it is. No, you're wrong. Because the only reason you can imagine that is because it's happening in your consciousness. And, and for, for that thing to is, for that thing to be, even if it's just a material object, it's the truth of it is that it still is exactly what it is. A equals A. So if it is that thing, that means that it has to accept itself. Relative to itself, it has to accept itself. So the material, the material universe, as you are calling it, has to accept itself for what it is. And that's consciousness. I know it's probably not very convincing to you. It doesn't sound logical at some level. Um, because it, it, you can't you can't put this into words. I'm kind of I'm trying to hint at it. Maybe you can get it. Maybe not. Um, but yeah, you just have to realize that um, for something to be, it has to be the truth, and that is what consciousness is. Stop thinking of consciousness as some biological phenomenon that is happening in the brain. Stop thinking of it as a, as a byproduct of living creatures. That's not what consciousness is. Consciousness is simply what is. Living creatures are not conscious. You are not conscious. Rather, that human body that you think is you is being imagined by universal consciousness which is not had by any entity or creature or being it is it just is it's the truth it's the absolute truth and it has to accept itself What I'm saying is that just for a physical object to exist, like this finger, for it to be here right now, it has to accept that it's here. It's a little weird to say it that way because usually we attribute acceptance to a, to a psychological function of a human. <laughs> but you have, to, you have to see acceptance as a sort of a metaphysical existential thing, as a physical thing. Physics is acceptance. Like, reality has to accept itself to allow itself to be itself. 
I don't know how else to say it. Hopefully that cleared it up. <laughs> if you're confused, I understand you need mystical experiences. We can't go any deeper with words. So it's not enough merely to accept yourself, though. You might think like, well, Leo, so what's the difference between self-acceptance and love? Aren't they just the same thing? So why don't we just say acceptance instead of love? Why do we have to bring love into it? It sounds too girly and too emotional. But it is love. We're not merely talking about acceptance here. You can't get more. See, the problem with talking about love is that it, there's nothing, there's nothing but love. So you can't explain it anyway because anything you're using to explain it is itself it. So you must enter into an ecstatic union with yourself. When consciousness realizes what it is, when consciousness becomes conscious of itself, it enters into an ecstatic union with itself. It recognizes its own existential beauty. You as consciousness recognize how amazing you are. And you are amazing. We are amazing. We are consciousness. We are the only thing that will ever exist, could ever exist, and we have existed for eternity. We are it. We are consciousness. We are love. And the only problem is that some of us don't recognize it. Some of us recognize it more than others. Some of us recognize it, then we forget. And then we recognize it again a year later, then we forget. Then we recognize it a week later, then we forget. And then some of us are recognizing it all the time, 24-7. Those would be the mystics and the yogis who've done a lot of work on themselves and are really awake. Do you realize how amazing this is right here? How amazing you are? How amazing everything is? Even all the stuff you hate. How amazing it all is? Just the fact that it is, and it's been forever, and that this is a function of infinite consciousness, this is so amazing. There's, it's so amazing, there's nothing else to compare it with. It's infinite amazement. That's what we are. We are infinite amazement. And I'm suggesting that your job is to recognize that more and more and more. And the more you recognize that, the more amazing your life gets. How do you create an amazing life? By recognizing that life is already amazing under all conditions. Unconditionally amazing. And when you recognize your own amazement, the amazement of the whole universe, you fall in love with it. Literally, you are falling in love with yourself for eternity. That's what God is. That's what life is. That's what we're doing here. That's the only thing that can ever be done in reality. Nothing can ever be done that's not that. All the technology we create, all the wars we fight, all the societies we build, all the people we help, all the charities we contribute to, all the children we save, all the diseases we cure, all the animals we save, everything that we ever do and will ever do as species will be us falling deeper in love with our own selves. Because there's nothing else to do but recognize our own amazement more and more and more. See? Every new scientific discovery that's made, every new photograph that's taken and put on the, on the internets and that you marvel at, you know, they take, they take a photo of a black hole or they take a photo of some nebula that looks pretty or they take some photo of, of a planet, you know, we fly by Pluto or Neptune or something, snap a photo from a satellite. We, we go to Mars, you know, the first man on Mars in 50 years or whatever, you know, maybe it's Elon Musk. He's standing there on Mars with this photograph, you know, he takes that photograph, then he's going to post it on the, on Twitter or something. And, uh, and what are people going to do? They're going to, oh, wow, it's amazing. Or like Elon Musk reveals the, the, the stupid cyber truck. <laughs> God, that thing's ugly. He reveals that thing. And it's like, oh, wow, amazing. Everyone's like, amazing. Even the people that hate it are still like, oh, it's amazing. But what is that? That's just a new aspect of yourself being revealed to you. See, it doesn't matter if it's a truck or if it's a, a, 
a kitten or if it's a planet or whatever it is, new stuff is being revealed all the time. New technology, new creatures are evolving, uh, new ideas are, are occurring in your mind. All of it is amazing. Always. Even the stuff you hate, it's still amazing. You just hate it because you're selfish, because you're biased. But from God's point of view, nothing is hated. It's all amazing. It's all equally amazing. It's all equally great. This is infinite love. Consciousness in love with what it is. Forever exploring itself. Ta-da! That's what we're doing here. Let me just underscore that self-love does not mean that you become a doormat. You can still take action. You can still have boundaries. It doesn't mean anything goes. In fact, if you're a doormat, that's because you lack self-love. If, if you've struggled with people-pleasing your whole life, it's because you have low self-esteem and you lack self-love. Otherwise, you'd have boundaries. Self-love is also not a feminine quality. Make sure you don't make that mistake. Think that, oh, Leo, but you're going to turn me into some sort of girl, some sort of woman, or some sort of soy boy. Um, you know, I'm a macho man. I'm a sort of a Joe Rogan type. I don't want this self-love. I want something, you know, something like I want some meat and some barbecue and some testosterone and some sports muscle cars. This is the kind of stuff that I'm interested in, not your uh, girly self-love. It's not girly self-love. Self-love is truth. Self-love is the ultimate truth. It's more true than physics. It's more true than mathematics. I want you to open your mind to that possibility. Mathematics and physics is something humans invented. Self-love is prior to the existence of the universe. It's not a human thing. It integrates everything. It's both feminine and masculine. It's both strong and weak. It's both rich and poor and everything else that you can think of. This is not going to make you girly. If anything, this will make you the strongest man you can be if what you really care about is being a true man. Although, really, <laughs> you're not going to be man at this point. You're going to be God. You want to be God? You want real God mode? Self-love, motherfucker. That's God mode. Acting macho and tough, that's not God mode. That's, that's man mode. In fact, that's juvenile man mode. That's boy mode. Man boy mode is what that is. God mode is self-love. God mode is integration of everything, including feminine and masculine, together. And transcending all that. You don't even know what an orgasm is until you've realized that you're God. And that you are self-love. Self-love is like an infinite orgasm that never ends. Also, don't make the mistake of thinking that self-love is egotism or narcissism. This is not truly self-love. This is small s self and lowercase l love. Which is, in fact, the obstacle to the self-love that I've been talking about up to this point. So, like I said, to expand uh, or to practice self-love, how do you actually practice it? You must expand your sense of self and you must expand your sense of, of love. And so here's a practical way to do it. You're going to take a wristband like this, put it on your wrist, and for the next week you're going to walk around. Every time you notice this wristband on your wrist, uh, you are going to remember that throughout the next week you are looking for stuff that you hate or that you judge. And anytime you notice something that you're hating or you're judging, you're judging a car, you're judging a picture, you're judging a celebrity, you're judging some politician, you're hating him, whatever. You're going to flip that around and you're going to accept and embrace 
that thing that you're judging and hating, you're gonna accept that first of all as yourself. You're gonna expand your sense of self to include that thing. So if you're watching the news and you see Donald Trump up there lying and bullshitting, whatever he's doing, you're gonna expand your sense of self to include him as you. So he's you. Can you accept that? If you see some Tesla Cybertruck and you think it looks ugly, great. Now notice this and realize, oh, that's me. That's part of the universe. So let me accept that as myself too. And then as you expand yourself, self, also love yourself. So first you expand your sense of self to include that object that you've been disconnected from, your shadow. Integrate that shadow object. And then I'm not telling you to love that object directly. Instead, I'm telling you to love yourself, right? So if ordinarily, let's say I look at this, I look at the Tesla Cybertruck, I think it looks ugly. Okay, that's sort of coming from my ego. Then I pause for a moment, I see this and I realize, oh, okay, that truck is actually me. I expand my sense of self to include the truck. I look at that truck and I say, ah, okay, that's, I'm looking at myself now. I'm looking at, basically, I'm, it's, I'm looking at that truck as though I'm looking in the mirror, as though I'm looking at my own face. And then I fill myself with love for myself, but myself is no longer just the Leo unit and body here. It includes the truck and maybe more stuff as well. It includes all that, probably the whole universe. So uh, feel love now for the whole shebang as a whole. Feel love for that and recognize, just remind yourself, you don't even need to have mystical experiences to do this. This is just an ordinary exercise. You can practice this. Just then remind yourself, using your t inner talk uh, from your mind, remind yourself that this is what I am, and this is what I love, is being myself, exactly how I am. I don't need to change myself. If that car it looks ugly, whatever, I love it anyways, like that. If your child does something you don't like, okay, fine. But then expand your sense of self to include a child and then say, okay, but I love the whole situation. And a good question you can ask yourself to do this is ask yourself, what is something I find ugly about life? Does something come up for you right now? Do it. Do it right now with me. Think of something that you find ugly about life. I don't just mean physical appearance. Ugly is a, is a broad term. Uh, I'm using it more figuratively and metaphorically here uh, than literally. For example, maybe you find racism ugly. Maybe you find religion ugly. I don't know, whatever. Uh, so bring that up to mind. And then remind yourself now that that is you. That thing that you think is ugly is you. Now embrace that ugliness because it's true. You see, this is... This is the connection between love and truth. I'm trying to point you to it. Can you see this? It's a little subtle. If you love the truth, you love reality exactly as it is and not some other way. Exactly as it is. To be able to accept reality exactly as it is, you have to love what is. You see? Otherwise, you can't accept it. Therefore, truth and love are, are literally identical. To have the truth of something is to love it at the same time. The love is what allows it to be true and vice versa. See, reality and consciousness is such a remarkable thing. 
It's so infinite. It includes so much infinite diversity. It includes cockroaches and snakes and aliens and humans and planets and stars. And it includes rapists. It includes murderers and terrorists. It includes Hitler. It includes Stalin. It includes everybody you don't like and, and a million more things. It includes all of that. That's what consciousness is. It's infinite. It has no limit. It's endless creativity. That's you. Can you accept that? Can you accept yourself? This is your true face. When you take the totality of everything that, that is, the good and the bad, and you look at all that, and you look at it, and you say, now I'm really looking in the mirror. Before, when I looked at my face in the mirror, that wasn't my real face. My real face is this entire singularity of every fucking thing. This is what I am. This is God looking at God. And then saying it to itself, yeah, this is what I am, and I love it. I don't need it to be different. And it can't be different. It's a tautology. It's infinity. It can't be different because it is everything. It is all possible difference. That is the pinnacle of self-love. When consciousness understands and accepts all of itself. That is the full reunion to which you ultimately want to get to. And then only by reaching that reunion, that ultimate reunion of all, of all divisions, of all differences, then from that you can, you can come back into the world of difference and division and uh, everything is recontextualized because you realize that you're just exploring your own interstices. as God in various limited ways, as a human, as a cockroach, as a bird, as an alien, whatever it is. As a, as a trash can. <laughs> Consider the possibility that it's possible for you to exist as a trash can and to be conscious as a trash can being a trash can. Sound weird and impossible? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, the deeper you go in this work, the more you will see that it's all about self-love. Right now, you are hearing this maybe for the first time. You haven't had these mystical experiences. You haven't had this grand reunification. You haven't recognized yourself as God. So right now, you can't appreciate what self-love really is. You need a reference experience which is empty for you right now. It's too abstract. And that's fine. Five years from now, ten years from now, you'll come back and you'll you'll understand. And you'll see how this played an important role in planting a seed in your mind that ultimately sprouted into uh, this grand reunification. Now, you might say, but Leo, so you say that self-love is the only teaching, but don't you teach a lot of other stuff that isn't about self-love? Like, you talk about epistemology, you talk about quantum mechanics sometimes, you talk about Goodles and completeness theorem, you talk about cults and you talk about psychedelics or you talk about politics or you talk about life purpose or you talk about spiral dynamics. You know, Leo, what what is what does quantum mechanics or spiral dynamics have to do with love? All of these things I talk about are gonna converge and lead you towards the realization and embodiment of self-love. So even the stuff that doesn't seem like it it has to do with self-love, of course, from a strictly technical standpoint, you know, if, you, if you're studying quantum mechanics, it doesn't talk about love. So I'm not saying that, that you know, quantum physicists understand love or that they're, they're proving love. No, not, not at all. You're going to have to go way beyond all that. But it's going to be a stepping stone for you. Eventually, you'll understand how all of it came together, led together, and... Uh, all these various techniques and concepts that I've shared with you, they were all in some way playing a small part, a little stepping stone that helped you to climb the ladder up to the top 
um, of Mount Everest and look down below and see all of creation underneath you as you, you looking at yourself. See, and all these different tools and models and theories and concepts and and techniques and things that I've shared with you. These were just um, just helpful little tools to get you there. If they were, some of them might not be helpful. Some of them might be a distraction. So you have to figure that out for yourself. What you know, what works for you. I want to leave you with this. Self-love is your touchstone in life. It's your compass. It's the thing you return to when you're lost. When something is going wrong in your life, terribly wrong, and you don't know what to do, you're confused, you're befuddled, bewildered, overwhelmed, remember to ask yourself, how is self-love lacking in this situation? But remember to keep a very robust notion of self and love in the back of your mind, right? Very robust notion, very broad notion, sort of an existential notion of it, not an egotistical notion. So it's not always that you need to, you know, um, act more from your ego. In fact, usually not. But just ask that question. How is self-love lacking here? Notice that Self-love is not taught in school or in university at all. It's not taught at work or at business at all. It's not taught in marketing and sales at all. It's not really even taught very much within dating advice or relationship advice. It's hardly even taught in churches. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing that of all the different teachings that there are, all the different institutions we have, you know, we have churches and schools and universities, we have Harvard and MIT, and we have, um, we have think tanks, and we have magazines and journals, and we have, you know, all this. Um, but none of them teach self-love. Isn't that amazing? And then we wonder why is the world so screwed up? Why is our society so screwed up? This is why. Now, of course, I'm not saying I'm the only one who teaches this. I mean, many yogis and sages and mystics and religious leaders have taught and demonstrated self-love to you from the beginning of time for over 10,000 years. The Hindus have done it. The Christians have done it. The Jews have done it. Every, this is what religion is in its purest, truest, uncorrupted form. The problem is that it gets so corrupt so quickly and so few people really ever understand it personally. Rather, they take it on as beliefs and dogma and so forth. Um, that it gets drowned out. And in fact, those very mechanisms that are supposed to be teaching you about self-love, they teach you the opposite. You can even go to a guru. You can even go to an enlightened master. You can go to an enlightened Zen master and he will tell you that love doesn't exist. That love is an illusion. You can go to some um, neo advaitin teacher, and he will tell you that, oh, love is just an illusion. And once you awaken, you will realize love is nonsense. Right, because they haven't awoken to love yet. So they'll tell you that with a straight face and they'll mislead you. Not because they're evil people, just because they don't know what they don't know. And there's many flavors, degrees, and versions of awakening. They're not all the same. And it took me quite a few awakenings to, to, to really lock down this, this notion of self-love. Here's a homework assignment I'll leave you with besides the, uh, you know, you're going to do this wristband thing, I hope. And then also, I'd like you to make a list of all the ways in which you don't love yourself. It could be your physical appearance. It could be your personality. It could be moral failings. It could be stuff you've done in the past. It could be mm, the way you treat other people. Um, could be your health condition that you have. Whatever. All the ways you don't love yourself. Make a long list. Get them all out of your system on this piece of paper. And then at the end of that, decide to love all of that. Embrace all of that as what reality is. This is what you are. Of course, you're a lot more than just that, but you are that too. So embrace that. 
And as you're trying that, you're going to struggle. Notice that there's a struggle. Notice it's hard. Notice that the ego in you resists accepting all that. Because you, you want to be some sort of ideal self. You want to be the way you imagine yourself on the silver screen in a Hollywood movie. That's what isn't. That's untruth. You see why truth and love have to go hand in hand? Because for something to be true, it has to be exactly the way that it is and not some other way that you want it to be or imagine it to be. So maybe you imagine that I shouldn't say the word fuck. Or maybe you imagine that I shouldn't talk about rape. Or maybe you imagine that Leo should have more hair. Or maybe you imagine that Leo should have a smaller nose. Or maybe you imagine that Leo should look younger or older or do his beard different or whatever you imagine. All of that is not true. What's true is exactly what's here right now. This is what I am. Like it or not. And there's only two options. We can either accept it or we can reject it. If we reject it, we cut ourselves off from ourselves. Do you see the insanity of rejecting it? To reject any part of reality is literally insanity. You are saying that what is true is untrue, and you are saying what is untrue is true. And that is the very definition of what I call devilry. That's how the devil is born. By rejecting the truth for a fantasy. And the reason that happens is because the devil can't stomach the truth exactly as it is. He needs it to be something else. And from that, all evil manifests. From untruth. Evil is untruth. Evil is self-denial. Lack of self-love. Which is why the only ultimate solution to evil is a reunion, a reintegration of all of your shadows, and total self-love. That's you coming home. That's what you've always been. That was the truth. It's just that the truth is so big, it got disconnected from itself, confused itself with falsehood. But eventually it came home. The truth cannot not love itself. It must love itself. Otherwise, it's not true. It's false. And that is how love and truth are actually identical at a metaphysical essential level. And that is why there is no full awakening without the realization of love. If you think you're awake or enlightened, and you haven't realized love, you haven't fully realized truth. You've only got one side of the coin. You think you have truth, but you're missing the love. And conversely, if you are an emotional person and you find it easy to love people, to love animals, to love children, and you're this sort of lovey-dovey type, Yet your whole life, you know, you've been loving. Maybe you're, this probably is more appropriate to women or to more feminine leaning men. You know, uh, women tend to be more lovey dovey. And that tends to be their approach to spirituality. It's like, Leo, I don't like talking about truth. You know, truth is so bleak and harsh and brutal. Uh, love, love is what I want. I want more love in my life. I want the spiritual path towards awakening through love. I don't really care about the truth. Leo, why should I care about the truth? It's just a, some philosophical minutia, or it's some sort of technical thing, this truth that you keep talking about. I don't care about it. I just want love. But what you're failing to realize is that love is truth. Your love is incomplete until you realize that the thing you love the most is the truth. Otherwise, what are you loving? 
If you're not loving the truth, you're loving falsehood, which makes you a devil. And your love is... Your love is divided. It's not total. Truth and love are one. Don't forget it. Learning self-love is the point of human life. If you loved yourself completely, you would have no more problems left in your life. Let me repeat that again. If you loved yourself completely, you would have no more problems in your life. This is true. Really think about that. Contemplate that one. Is it true? And if it is, what does that mean? What should you do about it? All right, that's it. I'm done here. Please click the like button for me and come check out actualize.org. That's my website. You'll find the Life Purpose course, the book list, my blog, where I'm posting new stuff. You can also uh, click the link down below in the description for the Patreon link. If you'd like to support this work, help me to spread it in the future. I'm building a little bit of a of a, a nest egg that will help me with an advertising budget and so forth, try to expand Actualize.org in the years to come. I think that will be a little handy and we could spread the word, um, get more people to realize the power of some of these teachings because they're pretty rare. And otherwise it's difficult for people to find them. And uh, uh, I just want to leave you with one last um, sort of a tip or warning, I guess. Be careful with watching only a few of my videos. I have a lot of content at this point, over 300 videos. You don't need to watch them all, of course not, but there's a trap here. The trap is that you come in and you watch a couple of my recent videos, and the stuff that I talk about now is so advanced uh, that uh, it's very easy to get lost and to misunderstand various words or phrases that I use. Because you have to understand that we've been kind of a, on a journey here with Actualized Network for seven years. Some people have been growing with me throughout this whole process. Um, if you just watch one or two episodes, you're going to easily, easily take things out of context, easily misunderstand things. Um, make wrong assumptions about me, make wrong assumptions about these teachings, certain things, you know, I'm, I'm, this, this work really is a deep body of work that builds upon itself. We're building a very, we built a very deep foundation over the years. You do have to go back and watch some of those very deep foundational episodes about epistemology, about metaphysics, about quantum mechanics and other things. You know, groundwork has been laid and I can't rehash all of it every single time in every new episode. So especially if you're new to this and you've only watched a few of the recent episodes, um, you're going to have to, if you want to get the full value of this work, to really understand it, you're going to have to go backwards and really dig through my work. Yeah, it takes time. It takes time. That's one of the biggest challenges of this work is that it's so voluminous. It's enormous. It's huge. Organizing it all is a nightmare. It's really difficult to organize this stuff and to break things down into separate little episodes and to put them in order of which you should watch them. It was really difficult to do that. That's one of my biggest struggles with this. I rack my mind over it uh, every every week about what's the best way to organize this material. And it, it's very difficult to organize it because it, it's just so sprawling that <laughs> you could spend a year organizing it. And then by the end of that year, you think, okay, I'm done, uh, but then you realize that, oh, well, that's just a little piece. <laughs> and now I have to reorganize even that piece because there's more pieces that come into play. And so every time there's new pieces coming into play and everything needs to be uh, reorganized. And, then, you know, people are coming in this at different times at different points. So they have to kind of like go through this giant web and crawl the whole thing to really get a sense of what its shape is. It's enormous. It's almost like we're trying to look at an elephant through a microscope. You know, every episode is a little peek at an elephant through a microscope. 
And to get a sense of the whole elephant, you got to probably watch at least 30, 50 videos, maybe 100 of my videos to start to see the full elephant. Well, and even that's not going to be enough. I mean, it's just going to be an outline, uh, just a guess for you. You're just going to have to do a lot of the practices. It's not just going to be videos. You have to read books. I mean, I'm asking a lot of you guys. And that's because the whole channel from the very beginning has been about depth. Depth. That's one of my top values in life is depth. The videos are deep. They're long because I want them to be deep. I don't want to do videos that aren't deep. I want to go deep. I want to go balls deep in this motherfucker. That's what I'm interested in. You know, if if I'm having sex, I don't want to just like stick the tip in and then like be, okay, cool, good. 10, little, 10, 10 minute video about God or 10 minute video about love. That's like sticking the tip in once and then coming. That's what that is. That's the equivalent of that in the bedroom. Like you want a good deep fucking. That's what you want. And you want it to last for a good hour. That's what you really want, right? If I mean, if you if you love life, if you love sex, that's what you want. You want that depth. But of course, that depth takes commitment from you. It takes work. Is it worth it? Well, I think it is. Give it a shot. <laughs> Study it for 10 years and then, uh, and then um, let me know.